Hello and welcome everybody to the Pick 6 podcast. Evan is not joining us this week. He is covering uh, Nebraska's baseball made availability. I'm Sam McEwen along with Jimmy Watkins, who must be inside because he's wearing a stocking cap and it's 99 degrees. So he must be in an air-conditioned space. Jimmy, how are you today? I'm doing well. I have actually been wearing uh, the stocking cap out in the sun recently, though, which I, I know makes me a disgusting hipster, but I, I just like, I'm, I've never really been a stocking cap guy, but I'm working on my, my stocking cap confidence. So I'm trying to wear them as much as I can. I don't think it's disgusting at all, but it does make you hot. If you, it does. You know. Well, I mean, I, I should say I wear them on a walk to the bar, so I'm not really, we're not talking about, you no know, every day, 90 degree heat. It's just, I wear it, I wear it to go out. All right. Well, hey, I wouldn't say that there's a ton going on in Nebraska sports in the sense that it's super hot right now. Um, You know, Nebraska football and Nebraska men's basketball are sort of in the midst of a recruiting moment. Uh, Obviously, uh, the basketball team is still trying to find that last one or two pieces in the transfer portal. Nebraska football is as well. Uh, They've also been out uh, doing a lot of offering of high school prospects. That's something that's going to be happening, Oh, you know, for for however many more weeks. Uh, before the visit season hits, which will be here on June 3rd. We'll have, obviously, full uh, full coverage of that uh, once once that rolls around. There are two visitors this week, and we will start the Pick 6 podcast there. Um, there are two transfer portal visitors this week, both of them from Alabama. Uh, Stefan Wynn, Stefan Wynn, and Kane Williams. One of them, Wynn, is a defensive tackle that I think Nebraska will probably take in a heartbeat. And Williams is a safety which is interesting because uh, he's from a, he's from a town where he would have had a good relationship with Mickey Joseph. He's from uh, an area that, that would have, that would point to why Nebraska would be connected to him. Uh, But Nebraska seems to have quite a few guys in the defensive backfield um, who could play. Jimmy, it was interesting to me that over the course of, of, of the spring, I felt like the, the general feedback that we got, from not only uh, Eric Chenander, but also Travis Fisher, he felt pretty good about the, the caliber of guys that he might have had in the secondary despite the big losses. And yet here they are pursuing a, a transfer safety, good athlete, good player in high school, but nevertheless an extra body that they got to put back there with the scholarship situation that they have. Yeah, I mean, I think Travis Fisher is one of the more respected minds on that staff, one of the more respected coaches. He has – um, the independence to to go in and, and bring a guy regardless of the situation, bring a guy in regardless of the situation in his room. And the other thing that we know about him is that he guarantees nothing to the guys in that room. He runs a tight ship and it doesn't matter if he thinks I, I we should say that I assume that we think that like we, we both think that Nebraska has enough in the defensive backfield to go on just fine the way they are. Um, it's possible that they go after Kane Williams because they don't think that's the case, but I don't think that's the case. But I think that Travis Fisher is, is runs a cut through defensive backs room. And if he thinks that Kane Williams is better than one of the guys he has, even if he thinks the guys that he has are good enough to play right away, then he's going to bring that guy in. It doesn't matter. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think there's certainly something to be said for wanting to add players that the challenge they have at this point, Jimmy, is that they're basically at 85 scholarships and you have to be at 85 by the time you go into training camp, which is in late July. And any player they add from here, they're going to have to lose somebody. And the challenge is if you if someone transfers after May 1st, if their name isn't in the portal, well, <laughs> they don't get immediate eligibility next year. And so Nebraska's cleared all the portal guys that they're probably going to have. Uh, that are going to get immediate eligibility next year. The only thing you got left really is graduation guys, guys that might graduate and then be able to, you know, kick out and transfer wherever they please or medical redshirt types, you know, so Nebraska may be holding some cards on a few players who they know probably aren't going to continue their careers. Um, But right now they're, they're basically at 85 and anybody they add from here is going to be somebody they need to subtract from the current scholarship numbers. King Williams is one, obviously. Stefan Wynn is another. And, you know, Wynn is a player that had uh, is experienced in the sense that he was at Alabama for a long time. 
So this isn't this isn't a, a kid. The King Williams is is young. I mean, he he would be with Nebraska for 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 some time. Um, when whose father played uh, tight end at Clemson uh, back in the day, probably 25, 30 years ago. He, he's got a year left. That's it. So he's got a, he's a one-year guy. That's all he has left. He's played some, right? So he played in seven games last year for Alabama. Um, he was in kind of a rotation. I uh, wouldn't describe him as one of their best players, but remember that Alabama's a pretty good football team, and they have some of the best defensive linemen in the country. Um, if Alabama quarterbacks and running backs have tend to be a little bit overrated once they go to the NFL, with the exception of Derrick Henry, the Alabama and the defensive linemen haven't really been overrated. <laughs> they've been they've been pretty good in college, and then they are pretty darn good uh, once they get to the NFL. And so, Win was I just think caught up in a, in a rotational issue, and he's going to spend one year. And I think if Nebraska adds this guy, he's about six four, three hundred and thirty pounds. I got to be honest with you. I think you like their defensive line, their defensive front more than you would have back in February when Phil Darius Payne, Casey Rogers, and Jordan Riley were on the roster. I just, I just do. Um, I, I think you would take um, Stefan Wynn, who I think is better than Jordan Riley. I mean, Riley didn't do much at Nebraska. Um, I think Devin Drew and Casey Rogers are sort of a wash. They're probably – an even trade. And then I think O'Shawn Mathis. Yeah. I think he's a better player than Phil Darius Payne. He's Is that your professional more, opinion, Sam? I think he's more productive. I mean, I think yeah. the numbers. Well, yeah, are, that's, that's my point. I think of yeah, course. I mean, the numbers are pretty obvious. And, and, and I, and I, you know, I think O'Shawn Mathis is probably a better football player. And so I, this will sound odd, but they might've gotten better. I think the one departure that they can't do anything about that I'm sure they would have loved to have had back was Damian Daniels, who didn't get drafted and ended up being a free agent signee with the Texans, I believe. And yep. he's going to have a hard time making a pro league. I mean, it's hard time. It's hard for a free agent defensive lineman to, to make it. Uh, it's just that that's a, that's a, that's a tough journey. So we'll see what happens with those two players. Evan will have an advance on, on those two guys coming into town. It's going to be interesting. Um, if Nebraska gets both of those guys, that's great. I, I, I still find it interesting that they're bringing in a safety. King Williams did go to Kansas yesterday, uh, and so or two days ago, I think. And so, you know, King Williams is looking at other schools. When I think uh, Nebraska would take um, in a heartbeat. We'll have more, I think, on high school guys next week. They have two major prospects coming up from Kansas City, and Caden Green and Jaden Doss. And huge, huge visitors. I, I think Nebraska is kind of a long shot for the first. Maybe we could get the second. Um, but the fact that they're coming up and they're kind of coming up on their own um, for their official visit, they're not going to be encased in the June 3rd thing is probably encouraging. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that next week. I think Nebraska has a sense of where they are in just about every position, which is encouraging. They remained relatively healthy in spring camp. They're, they're not taking a ton of injuries deep into the summer that were st- sustained in spring camp with the exception of Thomas Fedoni. I think Fedoni is one of those that was sustained. Um, Hickman's I think was sustained before spring camp, but um, so, you know, I think there's, there's, there's some optimism there uh, that a lot of the guys that are banged up are going to be back. Um, and they didn't take a ton of injuries with the exception of Fedoni to sustain that deep into fall. So it's a relatively healthy team. Uh, it's a team that, that is better liked by Las Vegas and uh, ESPN and analytics than most people around here like. Um, And that surprised me a little bit, but at the same time, you can kind of understand why when you start looking at the production of Casey Thompson, things like that. But it's also a team that, you know, two years out from when he has to commit, did not get a commit from Dylan Rayola, who is the, uh, the quarterback um, son of, Dominic Rayola, nephew of Donovan Rayola, who's Nebraska's offensive line coach, visited here in mid-April, uh, then visited uh, Ohio State, and then committed to Ohio State at 10 o'clock at night on, uh, what was it, Monday? I think it was Monday, um, which was a little surprising that he that he did it, A, at 10 o'clock and B, so quickly, but he's a Buckeye for now. And you know what, you know what was notable to me, Jimmy, is that I think most of the people in the community around here just kind of shrugged. Not because Dylan Rail isn't a great player. People just here just don't anticipate Nebraska getting that good of a player anymore. I think there was certainly, I mean, I saw at least on Twitter some 
surprise from fans. I think that they, um, there was at least, you know, he visited here. He's got the family ties. There was at least some modicum of hope that Nebraska would be in the running. I never thought that was the case. I thought like when you're, you look at the list of offers that guy had Ohio state, Alabama, Georgia, USC. I mean, use your brain, man. Like those guys are Ohio state and Alabama in particular. Alabama's got Tua, Mac Jones, and Jalen Hurts did most of his put most of his uh, game on tape at Oklahoma. Most of his positive game tape on, on tape at Oklahoma, but still went to Alabama. Those guys are in the league. Ohio State's got Justin Fields, had Dwayne Haskins rest in peace um, before before those guys. JT Barrett was undrafted, but what had a cup of coffee in the league. There are just so many things that those schools can point to when they're talking to five-star quarterbacks and say, we have this, we have this, look at, we got, if we put guys in the league, we have five-star receivers to put around you. We win 10, 11 games a year. If you play here for three years, you're probably going to play in a college football playoff that Nebraska just can't, they can't hang with. Like, I I think my, I'm not as, I'm not sourced up on this. Like you are and like, you know, Sip and Mitch Sherman are, but, I think the whole Dylan, Dylan Riola visiting Nebraska was a favor to Nebraska, a favor to, you know, a, a nod to his family. He has, he has a respect for the legacy that his, that his dad left here, but be honest with ourselves that, that was never happening. And I actually think, I actually think it's, it's a good thing for Nebraska that they got, they got let down easy this early in the process because if they had been strung along and again, I think because of the family ties and the legacy that, <clears throat> that the Rayolas have at Nebraska, I think there's a chance that they could have been, you know, in a top 10 or something like that. Sure. Um, that's complicated for the future of that, that position. If you don't get Dylan Rayola, right. Because every quarterback recruit that you host um, from the 2023 and 2024 classes and even 2025 they're looking around saying, okay, but like, what happens if this five-star kid is here? What am I doing here? You know, like if it's a five-star kid with a, particularly a five-star kid with that kind of family background, he's playing here. He's going to start. He's going to get every opportunity to prove himself as a starter. So it's, it's a good thing in my opinion that, that this got wrapped up so quickly and, and, you know, maybe he'll reopen his recruitment at some point, but, I think it's for the best for Nebraska to just move on, find a quarterback that is more within their price range, shall we say, and move forward that way. Yeah, he might reopen it. You never know. Ohio State's got um, – Cedar Stroud is in his final year at Ohio State. That's obvious. They also um, have a five-star 2022 kid and a five-star 2023 kid. So, Right. And so, like – once Stroud's season is over and he goes to the NFL, they're going to have to have a, a, you know, a quarterback competition. And if somebody wins that competition and then in 2023, they have a spectacular season. I don't even know what that would look like per se, but let's say they have a spectacular year. I don't know that Rayla would go there. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> if you didn't want to sit for two years, I, I just don't anticipate that being the case. I, now, that said, I, I haven't been blown away by the guys they brought in other than Stroud. Um, now, they got a couple of guys there on campus right now. We'll see. We'll see what they do. Uh, Stroud may be the last of those uh, for some time. And they didn't, you know, they got lucky with Fields. Fields left Georgia and they didn't, they didn't land him out of high school. They got, they got what I would consider a little bit lucky with him. Uh, in terms of in terms of getting him, I think Georgia made the wrong decision and who they decided was going to be their starter. Um, Georgia made a number of poor decisions in that regard, but they still won a national championship last year. Um, I don't know. Um, some some, some there, there's this quarterback recruiting thing is not an exact science, as we've learned. Uh, getting a five star does not mean you actually got the best quarterback. If you look at who gets drafted in the NFL. Uh, at the top of the list, there are definitely some five-star quarterbacks, uh, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. There's also Trey Lance. This year, there was Kenny Pickett, um, Malik Willis, who was a three-star, I think, who went to Auburn. Um, 
a lot of a lot of these cases, it's not necessarily the five star guys that develop. Justin Herbert was a three star who went to Oregon and was from uh, hometown Eugene, and I think Herbert's probably the most talented of all the young young NFL quarterbacks. And by young young, I mean like in their second or third year. Um, Josh Allen went to JUCO and then went to Wyoming. Uh, so it's not it's not definitive. Uh, so me, that's, thing, to, to me, that to me that gives all these you know these Ohio states, Alabamas. Um, I would throw USC in this pot now since they have Lincoln Riley in the mix and his track record with quarterbacks. That gives them even more of an advantage because they have the track record to say to these five star kids, you know, hey it's been a mixed bag with you guys just because you have these stars next to your name doesn't mean you're going to the league. But if you come with me, look what I've done. Look at all the people I've put in the NFL. And I I frankly don't care that Tua Tungavailoa isn't a great NFL quarterback right now, or that Dwayne Haskins didn't work out or that Justin Fields didn't light the world on fire as a rookie. All you can ask for is to get a chance. Like if you, any, any, whether the quarterback has a great career in the NFL or not, no one, there is no school that can say, look at this long line of dynasty franchise NFL quarterbacks that we have. That doesn't exist. Like, cause like you said, they come from everywhere. So the ability to say, look at all these high draft picks that's that I put in the league. That's about as good as you can do. And that's why I think that it's a no brainer for Rayola to have chosen Ohio state. And if he wouldn't have chosen Ohio state, and if he doesn't down the road, it probably choose Alabama or USC or right. Georgia or one of these other schools. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Except the guys that go to the NFL and are drafted the highest are often not from those schools. It, 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 to me, it, it underlines, although, and we'll move on here in a second. To me, it underlines that what's really valuable about being a quarterback is getting the chance to play quarterback for multiple years and learning how to lead and run an offense. And, you know, a lot of these guys that have gone to Ohio State have already transferred because they're not going to get the chance to do that there. So um, I think quarterbacks would be better served going to schools where they know they're going to play a lot, um, wherever that school is. And and hope um, with the caveat of knowing that you're going to be surrounded by enough talent that it's going to make you look good. Because I think the, the thing that I would say is most true of Ohio State is that they've had a bunch of NFL receivers who make those quarterbacks look good. I'm a Bears fan. And so I watched Justin Fields last season. And first of all, I'm not sure that Justin Fields in the NFL was throwing to receivers as good as the receiving core that he threw to in 2020 at Ohio State, which is a bizarre thing to say, but not hyperbole, given that Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave were just drafted in the first round. And the number four receiver on that team was Jamison Williams, and he was drafted in the first round as well. And so, A, I think that's possible. B, when you don't have the best receivers relative to the competition and the corners are taking them away, Justin Fields looked really pedestrian as a quarterback. He just did. Uh, he didn't look like the same player because he, he he wasn't throwing to open guys. He was throwing to guys who were covered. And Field t- did not learn at Ohio State how to do that very often because he, he just had the luxury of throwing deep balls to guys that were running past safeties. And his receiving core in the NFL, and to be very honest, any receiving core in the NFL just doesn't do that very often. Um, It's, it's much harder to do. It's just the the defensive backs are too good. You don't just, you know, you don't, most teams don't have Randy Moss who just run by everybody. So um, that was notable. And, and we'll, we'll see where it goes with Rayola, but obviously I think Nebraska is just at this point, they've lost five, they've had five straight losing seasons. It's very hard to sell a five-star quarterback when you've lost, had five straight losing seasons. Let's move to basketball here. Um, Jimmy, Nebraska is still in search of one more player, are they not? Like uh, a guy that can come and score 12 to 15 points a game and and put the ball in the bucket. Um, I know there's some names out there. Uh, They're probably not as good as some of the names that they were pursuing just two, three weeks ago. What is it looking like right now? Yeah, I think you're looking at at guys like – um, there's a kid from Chattanooga named Malachi Smith, who I know they're anticipating to hit the portal. I think he's actually in the portal. I think he's the number 25 um, transfer guy right now in the, in the portal. And that includes, I believe that includes the guys who have already committed to, and he was a four-star kid who came out and, and went to, uh, had offers to go to Ohio state, committed to Dayton, then ended up going to Wright state, didn't play there, red shirted, uh, ended up at Chattanooga. 
very efficient scorer at Chattanooga team that went to the tournament last year, uh, 19 points a game on, on good efficiency scoring numbers. He's got size. That's an interesting guy. Um, Kerwin Walton from North Carolina, freshman, uh, high recruiting pedigree is a kid that I know that they're looking at. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, a Stefan Wynn, Alabama situation. If you're good enough to play at Alabama, you're probably good enough to play at Nebraska. If you're good right. enough to play at North Carolina, you're probably good enough to play at Nebraska. Now is the team most likely to go back home to Minnesota. Yes. Yes. But these that's are, what these I are, figured. These <laughs> are, yeah, I, I would think the same way, but this is, these are the names that I've been hearing. Um, the kid, there's a kid from SMU. Um, I think his name is uh, Emmanuel. And he is an, um, a more interesting, like, and more interesting in terms of an eyebrow raise project to me. He has not scored very efficiently um, in the AAC, so I don't understand how that would like. If you're not if you're not scoring efficiently in the AAC, why aren't you? Why, why would we expect you to score efficiently at the Big Ten level? Now, you know, there's a ton of things that Fred does um, schematically and by putting shooters around guys that can make it easier. On, on guys that have the ball in their hands. Um, we saw that with Alonzo Verge last year to some degree. He, he did put up some of the best production um, of his college career. He did lead the Big Ten in assists, which is kind of a hilarious paradox to think about, but it is true. Um, so those are, those are the transfer names I'm hearing right now. To me, the interesting thing that's happening with, with uh, Nebraska ball right now is the fact that they have – sort of maintained this recruiting momentum that they had uh, last fall where they were, you know, remember they had the, the biggest recruiting weekend in, in Nebraska basketball history. And it was Omaha sure. Baloo and it was Simeon Wilcher, CJ's brother. And Jamarcus Lawrence was yeah. also on that trip. He committed. Um, Ramel Lloyd was supposed to be on that trip. He had already committed. And um, Denham Dawson was on that trip. He committed. So I think it's still a uh, Trey Green was also on that trip is who is now, um, put them in his top seven. And shortly after that, Gus Yaldin and, and Parker Fredrickson, two four-star kids, Trey Green, also a four-star kid, um, visited Lincoln as well. Gus Yaldin has put Nebraska in his top four. We're going to figure out where he's going next week. He's also considering Wisconsin, Rutgers, and the College of Charleston, which is an interesting, right. but a, a very nice town. I've been there. I like, I like Charleston, South Carolina a good deal. One of my friend's brothers attended school there. Um, so. To me, it's interesting that <coughs> you have all these kids there. You win 10 games. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily look pretty. You reshuffle your staff, including the guy who got all those guys to campus, Matt Abdomassi, and you're still on their radar in, in many ways. I think when you, you think about what Trev Alberts has been talking about with the football program, and I'm going to keep drawing this parallel because it's clear to me that he has the same plan for both of these, both of these programs. He wanted Scott to rethink the way he was doing things, change up his staff, and that's what he did. He wanted Fred to do the same thing. That's what's happened. And Scott was able to bring in some more talent. And that's why we're seeing Nebraska football with the seven and a half um, over under win total. That's why we're seeing ESPN's FBI project them to be the most likely team to win the Big Ten West, which I'll believe when I see. Right. Um, but it's just interesting to me that 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 Fred has been able to keep this thing going. And I think that's a credit to him. I think um, – Maybe we gave Matt Abdelmassi a little bit too much credit. And Matt deserves a ton of credit because he was working really hard and he's a hustler. He's a great salesman. Um, but I think Fred still, I said last week about the Baylor Shireman thing that I was wondering if some of this inherent trust in, in Fred's NBA background and the offense that he runs was wavering a little bit. I still think that could be true. And we still need to see where these kids actually end up going. It's entirely possible that, they liked Nebraska a lot at the beginning and they're keeping them around now as a courtesy to try to help keep their, you know, the brand strong. Um, but I think maybe I, I jumped the gun on that a little bit again, seeing, let's see where everyone goes, but it's interesting that, that Yaldin is, is, has kept them in the top four. It's interesting that Trey green um, is keeping them in the top seven. Parker Fredrickson just reopened his commitment. He decommitted from Oklahoma state this week and he's got a ton of family um, in Nebraska, he's he 
part of the reason that Parker Fredrickson was coming to Nebraska was so he could go to Nebraska football games. That's, you know, let's not kid ourselves about that. His family loves the Huskers, but that matters now that he's back on the market. So I think the, this momentum talk that Travis has been saying about the football program all off season, we could see something similar with the basketball program. If they get two of these four star kids or, you know, even three, one, even one, you know, after the season they just had would be a win. Um, and if that happens, I think the leash gets a little bit longer on a, on a coaching staff that is under a lot of pressure right now. Right. Because I don't think any, anyone, I wrote about this this week. I don't think any should be, anyone should be under any pretenses that Nebraska is going to turn it all the way the heck around next year. You know, the, the big 10 has lost a lot, 20 of the 26, all big 10, um, selections from last year are either graduated or in the NBA draft, but they're reloading Illinois, Ohio state, um, Michigan and Indiana all have top 10 recruiting classes. Michigan state could, I think Michigan state will get Max Christie back. I think, um, Maryland should be improved just because they have a, a non-disastrous coaching situation on their hands. Right. And, even teams like Minnesota and Penn state have top 30 recruiting classes. The big 10 is going to be brutal, but if you can, if you can sell a brighter future, you can get more leeway on, yeah. on what, what your expectations are next year. Yeah. I, I agree with all of that. Maybe say with the exception of Maryland, I think that's going to be a kind of a reset and kind of a re-rebuild. Well, they have a lot of the guys back from last year besides Ayala. So I don't know. We'll see. They weren't very good last year. So it's not, it's not a jump for them to be better. We'll see. We'll see what happens with them. Um, Yeah. I mean, you know, what is the timeline on? So Yalton, is that how you say it? Gus Buzz. He's he's announcing next week. And then Fredrickson, he was committed Oklahoma state. Now he isn't. Right. These are guys that would join Nebraska's team next summer, right? Yep. 2023 kids. And and I say that, I, and people would be like, well, duh. Well, no, basketball players reclassify a lot. And sometimes they do that, and they join a team right away. That's just how those things go. Neither of those guys are reclassification types, though, right? I don't know. Neither of them are – the, neither of them have the physical profile that suggests that they would be ready for that sort of thing. Fredrickson is – a really skinny kid. I think he's like, he's six, three, like, like one sixty or something crazy like right. that. Um, Yalden is a big man, six, eight, but I think that the, there's some conditioning work oh, to yeah. be done. Then he's a really, he's a really skilled player. He's an interesting prospect, like fascinating six, eight can handle the ball, shoot the ball, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I don't think either of those guys are ready to play big 10 basketball right away. Yeah. I think that's fair. If you had to guess at this moment who Nebraska is going to get transfer portal wise, who who do you think is the leading candidate? Ooh, ah, it's a good one. I I guess I would say Malachi Smith from Chattanooga. I don't. uh, The thing is, he's in the he's in the draft process. Um, Courtney Ramey is in the draft process. Umaha Gibson is in the draft process. It's gonna. I think it's gonna be a while. I think it's possible that we. I don't think it'll be quite as late as Alonzo Verge last summer, but. I think these guys are going to – They want they, these kids want to get as much NBA feedback as they possibly can before. And, it, and we talked about this with Bryce, even though he didn't, he didn't heed the advice. But I think it behooves any kid who's trying to jump from college to the NBA early to wait it out as long as they can and maintain their college eligibility as long as they can to make sure they are making the absolute best decision with the most information that they can have with that decision. Um, so I think it's going to be a while. Interesting. Bryce McGowan's is a NBA draft combine um, invitee. Trey mm-hmm. wasn't. Trey's nope. still with the program for now. Not a G League invitee either. Not a G League camp invitee either. Trey wasn't? Nope. Okay. The reason that matters, incidentally, is last year Delano Banton was a G League camp invitee. Did so well there that he got a combine invite. Did so well there that he was drafted into the NBA. And Nebraska, as you you and I both know, points back to that event 
th those sequence of events of, well, this is why things didn't go as well as we wanted. Because if a Delano Banton had come back, we would have had an unselfish point guard who would have set everybody up. And um, they're not going to, you know, he left. So we had to go get somebody. We got Verge. And oh, by the way, and, and you know, Alonzo Verge got too much criticism, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, that the chemistry wasn't perfect there. My, my theory is that Delano Banton was so different from Trey McGowan's and Kobe Webster that nobody really were like, well, Delano's got his role. Kobe's got his role. Trey's got his role. Verge was like both of them. And I think it was, it was and better, guys, by the way, better offensively, better at what they did. than they No were. question. Um, well, I mean, he probably wasn't as good of a three point shooter as Kobe, but Kobe didn't play as much. Right. And, I mean, we're talking about shot creation though. Right. Or, yeah. And I think that probably had something to do with it. I, 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 I think Banton was such that like everybody was like, wow, he's six, eight. He's going to the NBA. He's not very selfish. If he was, we would understand, but this guy who's six, one, what, what, you know, like it was, <laughs> it was that Verge was too much like McGowan's and, and Webster for that situation to, to easily smooth out. Whereas Banton would have been six, eight and would have been kicking the ball to Bryce McGowan's for spot up threes more times than you can count. As it stood, Bryce had to create a lot of his three-point shots um, because Virgil gets so far into the lane that he couldn't get the ball back out. And, and so Bryce was Bryce ended up taking 29-footers, standstill, all this other stuff. It's nobody's fault exactly, but it was a big domino that changed, I think, the way that Nebraska played last season when Banton wasn't there. They still don't really have an answer um, for, for the scoring thing, but they do have a player in Sam Griesel who fits some of the parameters that Delano Banton did. Sam was, is not, Sam is taller and he's not going to be a guy that I think gets all the way three feet in the lane and tries to flip the ball over five hands into the hoop. Like he's not going to do that. He's going to get into the lane and he's going to kick it out and he's going to be able to see because he's six, five and six, six. Yeah, and I think that the, the problem you were talking about with the, the crowded backcourt with similar skill sets. Um, it's both, it's both a blessing and a curse that they, I don't think they'll have that next year. It's a blessing because maybe you don't have the same awkward fits at times and guys, um, you know, potentially becoming jealous of each other, but <laughs> you do still need a couple of those guys, right? Like you need guys who can create shots for other people. That's why this last spot is so important. And they, they need to like right now it's, you know, I, I trust Sam to create shots for others. <laughs> After that, we're looking at like, you know, Ramel Lloyd has some interesting off the dribble flash. Um, he, from what I understand, he is more of an off guard than a primary ball handler type, mm -hmm. but every, you know, every guard wants to be that guy. So I'm sure he's working on it. I'm sure he has um, the skill set for it, but the, you run out of the lists, you run out of, uh, you run short on players quickly when you're trying to list guys who are going to be creators for others on this team. I think we may even see a situation where, like last year, more stuff run through Derek Walker, um, who's a good passing big man. Wilhelm Breidenbach is a skilled big man, good passer. Um, Blaze Keita, less so, but another guy who who showed at, at Coffeyville that, that he can find teammates um, when, when he draws extra attention in the post, it's going to be, I'm fascinated to see, first of all, who that other guy is going to be and what their offense is going to look like next year, because they've said they're going to run some two big lineups. Um, there's the spacing, like the Fred is known as the space and space, you know, th fire three pointers up there guy. There's not a ton of proven three point shooters on this team. Like CJ Wilcher's dead eye. Obviously we know that case a, we, you know, we know he can shoot. He shot 33% last year. That's not, that's not good per se. Um, Wilhelm Breidenbach has a reputation for being a good shooter. He played 10 games last year. Didn't shoot well in those 10 games. It's just interesting to me how they're going to function on offense next year. Mm. Hmm. We'll see. That's going to be interesting stuff. Uh, Nebraska baseball brief update. Uh, it's going poorly. Uh, well, it is. Uh, one of their relievers has left. 
Yeah. Uh, that is um, Tyler Martin is no longer with the team. So things are going well over there. They were already pretty uh, thin on arms too. It's, it's not a good yeah. situation. They got to win. They basically got to win the next, I don't even know, uh, six in order to, they got to, they got to win out to make the big 10 tournament. It, it, it's, it's a bad look and there will be time to do a postmortem after the season to figure out what the hell went wrong. But that is, is all we have for this week. We will be back next week to recap whatever happened with the two Alabama visitors and preview more recruiting. Uh, We'll know more then. For Jimmy Watkins, I'm Sam McEwen. This is the Pick 6 Podcast. Thanks for listening.